for tonight a really very big thank you to everyone who sent in a tape and don't forget there's 100 pounds for everyone we use so please please keep sending them in and next time the star of the show could be you good night please send your funniest home videos to you've been framed granada television manchester m60 9ea and we promise to return all your tapes of You Bet, which returns next Saturday on ITV. A coconut shire with a difference. Go. High tea at Westminster. Spins and tumbles as little meets large. Do you think they can do it? Place your bets for the new series of You Bet, returning next Saturday, 6.40 on ITV. The Devon Police hot on the trail because someone's been stealing lashings and lashings of Ambrosia Devon custard. Will your next car have a catalytic converter that removes 95% of toxic pollutants? Call Audi on 0800 585 685 to make sure. Mum, this inland revenue form, you don't pay income tax. So from April, you needn't pay tax on the interest on your savings. That's plain, isn't it? Oh, no, dear. It's plain and pearl. Just a few easy questions, Mum. That's nice, dear. And then you hand in the form at the Building Society. Oh, thanks, dear. What? I handed mine in weeks ago. If you don't have to pay income tax, you won't need to pay tax on your savings. Don't hurt me up in here. Too late. This lift has just entered the Twiglet Zone. Dedicated to the enjoyment of those lovely, crunchy snacks. Whole wheat, savory, and dangerously irresistible. <laughs> we apologize for the delay. Somebody opened a bag of Twiglets between stations. <laughs> Sorry, lads. There are some unopened Twiglets in there. Beware the Twiglet Zone. Easy to enter. Impossible to leave. Book your butlin's holiday. Katie! Now where can she be? Doesn't she want to go home? But remember, you won't want to leave. Some people have problems sleeping. For others, it's a luxury they can't afford. Anyone can feel a wee bit tired. Doesn't mean you're going funny in the head or anything. It's... I can cope. Listen, while you're there, uh, could you get Dr. Pettigrew to bleep me, please? Yes, I know. He's been bleeping you to bleep me to bleep him. I've been busy. Doctor's working, making us better. Mm. Hello. Phone over here. About face. Monday comedy on ITV. This is HTV Comedy Wales. We now join the studios of ITN in London for the news with Julia Somerville. Cheney heads for Washington to brief the president. Iraq's second city feels the force of Allied bombing. Cheltenham's black Tory candidate is confirmed. And the cold weather claims another victim. Good evening. The American Defense Secretary, Dick Cheney, is on his way back to Washington to advise President Bush on when to order a land war. Before leaving Saudi Arabia, he said there was a point of diminishing returns for airstrikes.
that's when land forces might be ordered into action. In other developments, on day 25 of the Gulf War, the Allies say 75 more Iraqi soldiers have defected. The Americans say one of their Marine Corps Harrier jump jets was shot down over Kuwait, one crewman is missing, and five American B-52s have returned to base at Fairford in Gloucestershire after what's thought to be their first bombing mission from Britain. Defence Secretary Dick Cheney told the pilots of the stealth bombers whose base he inspected today that their campaign had exceeded all expectations. But he is now admitting that a bombing campaign would not be enough by itself to win the war. I think there's a limit uh, to how long we can do that usefully. There's a point of diminishing returns when uh, you've struck all the targets that you can strike from the air, uh, when you've done everything you can to limit uh, his resupply, when you've destroyed all of uh, the armor and artillery that you can get at from the air, uh, when you might then have to use other forces in order to achieve your objective. But he has no doubt of eventual victory over Saddam. I, my own personal belief is there isn't anything he can do at this stage that would reverse the basic fundamental course of the war seems to me there's only going to be one outcome, and that's going to be his defeat. Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd, also in Riyadh today, has sounded confident. He said the British public was prepared to be patient and wait for the bombing campaign to work. I don't think they're going to get a war of all that length. Opinion has actually got more solid in the last few weeks, and not just in Britain, but uh, in the States and on the continent, and I think out here. So it's, it, that, that's not a real worry at the present time. As long as we, s we are clearly uh, sticking to the war aims of the UN, and as long as the campaign is being conducted as professionally and well as it is, I don't worry too much about public opinion. There are signs tonight that the bombing is having its impact on the morale of the Iraqi troops. The Americans, the Egyptians, and the Saudi Arabians are all reporting line crossings. That is, Iraqi soldiers who've decided to give up. There have apparently been 75 in the last 24 hours. And all those soldiers who are crossing over are saying that the incessant bombing is a major reason for their defection. Peter Allen, ITN, Riyadh. Western news teams have been allowed to visit the southern Iraqi city of Basra for the first time since the outbreak of war. They were shown extensive damage, the result, the Iraqis say, of constant bombing. Brent Sadler's reports are subject to Iraqi censorship. Correspondents in Iraq are restricted to areas approved by the Iraqi authorities. These are the first pictures of an Allied air assault on Basra. It happened last night. We could clearly hear the warplanes circling overhead, aiming the bombs before release. The attacks went on most of the night, with intermittent challenges from Iraqi anti-aircraft gunners. Compared to Baghdad, these air defences appeared relatively weak. It emphasises the extent of Allied air power in this phase of the campaign. This sequence illustrates it. Seconds after that bomb blast, you can see, as the camera tilts up, a blob of light moving steadily to the left. That is the attacking aircraft. The pilot had just dropped his payload and was increasing speed, afterburners glowing to escape. Remarkably, this attack drew no visible ground fire. As the pilot picked up speed, the afterburners were switched off and the plane disappeared into the stars. A refinery was left burning. One Allied sortie had just ended. Most people have now left Basra, which will be virtually cut off if the Allies sever a one remaining bridge. The weather has been clear for Allied reconnaissance missions. But these overflights should be sending back pictures of devastation to some of Basra's residential areas. The city's Civil Defence Corps took journalists on a tour of bomb damage in several neighbourhoods. The authorities say the level of casualties and scale of destruction is greater than at any time during the Iran-Iraq war. Remanda Jarjis is an Iraqi Christian living in the al Abbasiyah district. She said a large number of people were killed next to her home. When she took her in this house, because many, uh, their uh, relation have come here because they say here is very, you know, safe, safe because no uh, military uh, thing. My uh, daughter, four years, here, say why they want to make us dust and rock. 
Sorry. What should I answer? This one huge crater, approximately 20 feet deep, gives an idea of the size of bombs that have been falling into some civilian areas of Basra. But of course, it must be stressed that we have not been taken to see the effects of Allied bombing on any military targets or strategic installations in and around this city. One reason for the heavy assaults, which include damage to various buildings like this school, is that large amounts of army transport and equipment has been moving through the city. At the main fire station, they brought in metal fragments to demonstrate that cluster bombs were being used on civilians in some of the raids. We could not verify exactly where they fell. Then came the warning of another raid, and people began to get nervous. Other families have decided that Basra could become a second front and are moving to safer places. We never see injuries to military personnel because Iraq denies media access to army hospitals. But here in a mother and child ward today at a Basra hospital, we were shown some harrowing scenes. Figures for civilian wounded are sketchy, but the extent of these injuries, burns, fractures and amputations were grim. This couple were about to lose their three-year-old son, Hamdi. He is another casualty of this war. Brent Sadler, ITN, Basra. Reports from another correspondent who visited Basra said that some children had been burnt when kerosene stoves were knocked over in the dark after power failures. Brent Sadler says that in the ward he filmed in, the children were said to have been injured in the bombing. Tonight, a Ministry of Defence spokesman said Basra is a large petrochemical and industrial port, and as such, it would be a natural target for the Allied coalition forces in preventing supplies heading to the Iraqi forces who are occupying Kuwait. And, of course, targets would be military and strategic ones. The issue of civilian casualties in Basra was raised by an American reporter at today's British military briefing. One of our correspondents just returned to Baghdad after visiting Basra where he reported a great deal of civilian area damage there. How do you reconcile that with the precision bombing that you say this war is all about? And would Basra be any different than Baghdad? Well, I, uh, obviously, I, I, uh, I haven't seen that report. Uh, the fact is that uh, whatever I say must remain speculation in answer to the question. Uh, certainly, uh, on, on the um, uh, facts that we're aware of, uh, there's minimal civilian damage. And I think I illustrated that best yesterday when I explained that a whole uh, formation of tornadoes and buccaneer laser designators uh, actually returned to base with all bombs on board simply because they couldn't guarantee the point precision because of cloud uh, obscuring the target occasionally uh, they couldn't guarantee that sort of precision so they brought them back so you know into what I would regard as a responsible campaign here against the military uh, with always in the back of uh, crews minds the fact that um, uh, civilian casualties uh, are going to be kept to a minimum. Iraq says its decision to fight the Allies is irrevocable. It's called for all Arab countries to break off relations with the United States and other Western countries lined up in the coalition. Yevgeny Primakov, a special envoy of the Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev, has left for Baghdad. He'll try again to persuade the Iraqis to pull out of Kuwait. Five B-52 bombers returned to Fairford Air Base in Gloucestershire early this morning after what's thought to be their first raid on Iraq. The last time American warplanes used a British base was five years ago when they bombed Libya. Against the background of continued bombing, there's been a merry-go-round of diplomatic initiatives. In Jordan, Iraq's Deputy Prime Minister, Sadoun Hamadi, called on Arab nations to reject the UN resolutions on Kuwait and severed diplomatic relations with the countries bombing Iraq. Hamadi had met Iran's President Rafsanjani twice this week, but his remarks today seem to have put paid to any hopes for the Iranians' peace initiative. His determination was echoed by Iraq's ambassador to Paris. If they think that by killing civilians and destroying the civilian infrastructure of Iraq will demoralize the Iraqi people, they are committing a big mistake because it's working the opposite. Now, in terms of the, Ira the Arab mentality, the world revenge now is getting into the picture. In Belgrade, Iran's foreign minister arrived for a meeting of 15 non-allied countries 
which hopes still to mount a new peace initiative. Despite the Iraqis' determination, the Iranians believe there is room for maneuver. They are uh, under a heavy pressure. They are bombarded by the Allied forces and uh, they are determined to defend themselves. Uh, this statement is quite natural, but we have found out that they are ready uh, to talk uh, for a peaceful settlement. And Yevgeny Primakov, the special Soviet envoy who met Saddam in October, is going back to Baghdad. These initiatives may well represent the last hopes for peace before the ground battle begins. The Israelis say they've arrested 350 Palestinian activists in the occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip. Today, thousands of Palestinians went back to work for the first time since the Gulf War began. The Israeli government was forced to relax a curfew in the occupied territories out of economic necessity. And now other news. The government of Lithuania says it's delighted with the result of its unofficial referendum in which 90% of those voting backed independence from the Soviet Union. The turnout was 84%. It's just one regional problem facing President Gorbachev. Estonia and Latvia are to hold their own referendums on independence. In Leningrad, demonstrators have called for greater democracy. And there's growing nationalist unrest in Georgia. Today's preliminary results prove the determination of the Lithuanians to break away from Mr. Gorbachev's Soviet Union. This despite the blood spilt last month in Vilnius when nationalist demonstrators clashed with Soviet paratroopers. The 13 civilian dead are still mourned. The strong-arm tactics of the Kremlin, 1,400 KGB cadets have just been dispatched here, ignored. One soldier to each person with a gun. We will stand to, till the end. Lithuania's president, Vitautis Landsbergis, believes the strength of support for an independent Lithuania will send a clear signal to Moscow that force will not deter them. Estonia and Latvia have already announced their own referendums. Mr. Landsbergis hopes that even Russia may follow suit. And in Russia, more evidence of the widespread unease Mr. Gorbachev's policies have provoked. Thousands took to the streets of Leningrad today, reminding Mr. Gorbachev that opposition isn't limited to the Baltics. And all the time, Mr. Gorbachev's political rival, Boris Yeltsin, threatens the status quo. As leader of the powerful Russian Federation, his pro-democracy bandwagon rolls on, snapping at Mr. Gorbachev's heels. Yesterday, he visited Kaliningrad, on the border with Lithuania. His message clear. If Mr. Gorbachev isn't listening, I am. And more instability in Georgia, where clashes between nationalists and militia have left more than 30 dead. Soviet troops could be used here, too, to restore order to another republic simmering with political tension. It's difficult to see how Mr. Gorbachev can allow this political instability to continue. He's pledged to restore order and says he won't allow his authority to be flouted. The question now is, how can he do that without resorting to military force? Penny Marshall, ITN, Moscow. Here, Cheltenham Conservatives have voted by an overwhelming majority to retain the black barrister John Taylor as their parliamentary candidate. He could now become the country's first black Conservative MP. The Prime Minister, Mr Major, said it was the right decision. This was the showdown in the long-running political dispute which has so dented the dignity of this quiet Gloucestershire town. A showdown forced by so-called Tory rebels like Bob Williams. We want a choice of candidate besides John Taylor. We are not trying to deselect him. It's all about choice. After a two-hour debate at a secret ballot in Cheltenham Town Hall, Association Chairwoman Marion Drinkwater, Mr Taylor beside her, revealed that the majority had supported her executive committee. And so Mr. John Taylor has been duly confirmed as a Conservative prospective parliamentary candidate for Cheltenham. I'm obviously very pleased and I'm very grateful for the hard work that a number of people have put in on my behalf. There are still those here, though, who just don't want a black candidate. No, I'm English. And I'm England for the English, I'm afraid is what I think. Mr. Taylor, with his wife Cathy, believes he can become Britain's first black Tory MP. So that, Tory chiefs here hope, is that their candidate, Mr. Taylor, confirmed. It'll be a long time, though, before the constituency recovers from this protracted and very public squabble. Vernon Mann, ITN, Cheltenham. One person has died and another broke both legs in an avalanche in the Peak District. The injured man was flown by an RAF helicopter to hospital in Sheffield. 
In Scotland, mountain rescue teams have been braving appalling conditions. High above Glencoe, an RAF Wessex helicopter goes in to rescue an injured climber caught in an avalanche. It's a carefully coordinated operation involving the police, the local Glencoe mountain rescue team and the Air Force. It's very good climbing at the moment. There's lots of ice around. That makes it good for climbing. But uh, there's quite a bit of slab around, uh, and this slab higher up can be very treacherous. Each weekend, thousands of walkers take to the Scottish mountains, and so far this year, the toll's been high, with 11 people killed and many more badly injured. And mountain rescue has its perils too. This RAF team is practicing a technique which last week cost the life of a highly experienced civilian rescuer. Should the weather turn, which it can do any time, then uh, people are going to get lost, stuck, and uh, because of the temperatures, uh, people unfortunately are going to die. But the lure of the mountains is irresistible, and in a way, the danger is part of the challenge. Jim Buchanan, ITN, Glencoe. And now soccer. Manchester United are favourites for the Rumbelows Cup after a 2-1 win over Leeds in the semi-final first leg at Old Trafford this afternoon. Lee Sharp got the better of Leeds' Mel Sterling to put United ahead in the 67th minute. Three minutes later, a free kick, and Chris White found the gap to equalise for Leeds. Eleven minutes from time, United's Brian McClare cut through a go-mouse scramble to make it 2-1. That's it for now. ITN will have news summaries through the night, but from all of us here on the weekend team, good night. and freedom. I've forgotten where she is. Only in my area, when they're in the bushes and they might jump out and get you. Can't be approached a child often money for sex. And they could either take you in the car and strangle your neck. It still happens, people die. Instead of the threat being withdrawn from the children, the children are being withdrawn from the threat. Drivers are very naughty because they don't look where they go and they don't stop. World in Action asks, how safe for our children Monday at 8.30? Good evening. Well, many people are able to choose to stay indoors at weekends, but it's back to work for most of us in the morning, and we'll all be faced with icy roads, I think, a problem that we'll be faced with each morning for this week. Back to tonight's weather in more detail, though, still one or two snow showers around, especially out on those east coasts there. Most inland areas will become dry with one or two mist patches, and still a few light snow showers for those north-facing coasts out in the west over Northern Ireland and parts of Wales. Another cold night, of course, a widespread and really quite severe frost, though it's not quite as cold as it's been over the last few nights. Lowest temperatures tonight, probably around minus 7 or minus 8. On to tomorrow's weather now. Quite a few snow showers still to come for those eastern parts of both England and Scotland. The heaviest of them on the coastal areas that stick out in the North Sea there. Out in the west, well, you'll have one or two snow showers there too, but they should be few and far between and fairly light. And where we sheltered from those northwest winds, a fairly bright day, quite a bit of wintry sunshine around and a good deal of dry weather for central parts, I think. The temperatures tomorrow, well, creeping up slowly. It's getting above freezing for most of us tomorrow. A high of around four or five up in the northwest there. But you'll have a fairly fresh northwesterly breeze, so it's going to feel cold. And as you can see, further south, especially in the southeastern corner, temperatures really are still struggling just above freezing. Here's the sunset times for tomorrow evening. I'll leave you now with a national summary. And now the forecast for Wales. The night will be cold with a widespread moderate frost and icy patches on untreated roads. Lowest temperatures will be near minus 5 degrees Celsius, that's 23 degrees Fahrenheit. Monday will be a bright day with some sunshine at times. Many places will have another dry day, but the occasional snow shower is still likely, more especially on north-facing coasts. Daytime temperatures will rise to around 3 degrees Celsius, 37 degrees Fahrenheit, and the wind will be a moderate northwesterly. And the outlook for Tuesday, becoming cloudier with the risk of some more general snow. And that's the weather forecast. On Tuesday in Cardiff, Welsh super featherweight champion Andy Diabro takes on the vastly experienced Mark Reefer in a final eliminator for Kevin Pritchard's British crown. Down among the small men, Robbie Reagan from Kevin Forrest, three times Welsh ABA champion, goes for the Welsh flyweight title against another youngster with quite a dig, Kevin Jenkins from Ammonfords. Jenkins, too, a former amateur champion. Great action coming up then, just before midnight on Tuesday.
Yes, there are real five pound notes going into this dispenser. Join us in a minute and we'll see what happens. These aren't the only eyes that'll be on the new Ford Escort estate. Heavens above. That's marvellous, isn't it? That's ridiculous. Oh, well, you can't take two. Yeah, oh. I'll have one. Three, take one. I can't believe it. <laughs> oh, that's a lovely idea. I don't believe it. Since money isn't normally this easy to come by, shouldn't you make the most of what you've got? Now, all Midland Current accounts can sweep surplus cash straight into a high-interest savings account. What's that little thing there? I know, it's up to your watchy list. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness for that, they've got the power after all. And so could you have. National Power and Power Jet. Register for a prospectus by February the 15th, and you could get incentives. Separate detergent and softener could mean spending more than you need. Stop. Why buy two? Just buy bold. It's where the smart money goes. Imagine how many times you could use a new Hoover washer or cleaner before July. Well, buy an appliance over £100 at Manweb now, and you don't have to pay a penny until July. Manweb. Trust the experts. How are the tickets going for my uh, Soviet lecture tour? Sold out. Well, that's wonderful. Better book another gig, as it were. No, not Lithuania. There's always crowd trouble there. Ah, have been invited to meet Mr. Gorbachev at the Gremlin. Oh, I've forgotten all about that, Piers. All right, assume the position. Give it to me, big boy. All right. Oh. <laughs> Now, when you meet Gorby next week, you'll look just like him, won't you? The Stard prepares to spread the gospel of capitalism. Hello, Moscow! Привет, Moskva! And gets a few Soviet surprises. Tonight on ITV. Looking even further ahead to tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, wish you were here with Julius Chalmers and John Carter. At half past seven, we have a visit to Coronation Street. And at eight o'clock, the Ron Lucas Show. That's all tomorrow night. Now back to tonight, and Agatha Christie's Poirot. Thank you.